Well, good morning. Good morning. Look at the person next to you. Tell them happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. I hope you all had a great week and weekend. If we have not met, hello. My name is Alex. I'm one of our student pastors. I get to work with our middle school and our high school students, and I'm so excited to share God's word with you. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of Jonah to the book of Jonah. We're gonna talk about a story that just keeps coming up in my own life, in my own walk with God. And I'm just really excited to share some of the truth that I've been learning over these last few weeks. And as you guys are turning there, I just wanna talk about Thanksgiving for a second. How many of you guys traveled this past week? Anybody, anybody? Can we talk about Thanksgiving traffic, okay? Why? Why? Just use your blinker, just drive. How many of you guys had good food this week? Anybody? Okay, did anybody eat way too many carbs? Anybody, okay, I, um, I've, known to, I've been known to have a carb coma, okay? And that's where you eat too much stuffing or too many rolls or personally my own favorite, too much mac and cheese. Can I get an amen for mac and cheese? Okay, I sit at the kids' table sometimes because they have all the mac and cheese. Anyways, so to kind of combat that carb coma, I might ask you to talk a little bit. I might ask you to talk to the person next to you. I might ask you to raise your hand. Let's have fun this morning. Let's stay awake. And I really believe God's gonna speak to us through this amazing story from the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter one, starting in verse one. We're gonna read all of chapter one. It's a lot of reading, but you're in church, which means you signed up for it. So here we go. Verse one, it says this. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone down below deck where he laid and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What, what kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. Verse 11, the sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon everyone. Say you. That's important. We'll talk about that later. Verse 13. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die uh, for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Verse 17, now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. If you are taking notes this morning, the title of my message is one word. It's the word missteps, missteps. And we're gonna be in the book of Jonah all morning long, so stay there. We're gonna work through Jonah chapter one through four. And like I said, I really believe that there's some good stuff that we can pull from this. But before we jump in, I wanna pray. And then we're gonna talk about that word, missteps. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for who you are. God, thank you for an amazing week of just giving thanks. Father, of, uh, of being appreciative of what you have blessed us with. Father, I pray that that spirit of thanksgiving would not just last a week or a weekend, but God, it would embody who we are. God, most of all, we're thankful for you. We're thankful for your truth, your word. And God, we just ask that you would remove any distractions from us in these next few moments. Lord, we love you. Speak to us. It's in your son's name we pray. Everyone said, 
Amen. Missteps. Fun fact about me, I like movies. Any of you guys like movies? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Uh, tell the person next to you your favorite movie. Ready to go? Anybody? 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 Favorite movies? Favorite movies? Personal favorite, I know it was mentioned a lot at the movies, is Elf. Can I get an amen for Elf people? Let's go. Okay. I love movies, and this past August, I had a bunch of time to kind of relax from the camps that we did this past summer, and I decided that I'm going to make a movie goal. And one of my movie goals was going to be to, be, to, to watch all the Marvel superhero movies in order, right? So you guys know the movies. You guys know, like, Captain America, right? You guys know Thor. Um, let's see, what else is on? Iron Man, right? One, two, and three, okay? You've got the Avenger movies. And if you guys have Disney+, Plus, like, you can just crush all these, okay? Like, like they do a timeline on Disney+, Plus for you. And so I start going through kind of my, my movie goal, and I watch Captain America, and just watching Captain America crush bad guys is, like, one of my all-time favorite things. And um, then, then I watch, uh, I don't know, Iron Man and Tony Stark. He's kind of a jerk, but I like him, right? And then I got to the Avengers, and I'm like, oh my gosh, there are all these superheroes. It's amazing. And I start going through these movies, and then I get to a movie called Guardians of the Galaxy. Raise your hand if you've seen this movie, okay? Listen. I don't know if I've seen a more terrible movie. Don't lose me. Don't lose me. Don't lose me, okay? Don't lose me. I sat through it. I watched it, I was committed, and I was like, okay. I almost fell asleep, didn't understand it. There was this weird talking tree, right? Like, like I, I, didn't, I didn't get the movie, and, and then I jumped back into the time, and I'm like, okay, this is great. I can watch Captain America 2, or I can watch Iron Man 2, or I can watch, watch in, uh, you know, the, the next Avengers, whatever. And then I see it. Did you know that there's a Guardians of the Galaxy 2? Why would they make a Guardians of the Galaxy 2? Right? If the first one, again, my own opinion, I'm sorry to isolate people. If this is your favorite movie, please come back next week. Pastor Scott is here. It's going to be great. Okay? <laughs> but, like, why would you make a second Guardians of the Galaxy? And you want to know what I did? I quit my goal. How many of you guys are judging me? It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. This message is for you. Here we go. Okay? I quit my goal. Why? Because it was more painful for me to sit through another two-hour movie than to finish my goal. I thought I could be doing something way more beneficial like cleaning my garage or sweeping or learning basket crochet. I don't know, right? Like, I just felt like it was not worth it, so I gave up. Look at the person next to you and say, give up. Let me ask you a question this morning. Have you ever felt like giving up? Now, now, I know some of us, like, we, we give up on things all the time, right? Like, like, we give up on diets, right? We give up on things like, I don't know, friendships, or we give up on hobbies. Sometimes even we give up on jobs. But let me ask you a deeper question. Have you ever felt like giving up on God? Have you ever felt like giving up on your faith? I think if most of us were honest today, we would say, yeah. I felt like giving up. I know I've been there, Right? I'm sure all of us can identify with that feeling. And if you read the story of Jonah before, just like we read chapter one this morning, you understand that that's where Jonah is. When Jonah thinks about his faith, according to chapter one, Jonah has given up. He's throwing in the towel. And when it comes to God, Jonah wants to run the opposite direction. But when it comes to Jonah giving up on his faith, we have to ask the question, why does he want to give up? Why does Jonah want to throw in the towel? And I want to ask you the same question. I need to ask myself the same question. Well, why do we want to give up? Why do we at times when it comes to God want to throw in the towel and say, God, what you're doing, I don't understand. It's just easier for me to give up. See, I believe the reason why Jonah wanted to give up in his faith, and I believe the reason why we at times want to give up in our faith is boiled down to this one word, missteps. Missteps. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that word down along with its definition. Here's what a misstep is. A misstep is an intentional act that dishonors your commitment to God. 
A misstep is an intentional act that dishonors your commitment to God. It means that you intentionally go against your promise. It means you go against your word. It means you go against your covenant that you made with God. And here's what I've found. It's that when I walk in missteps, it's so much easier for me to give up on God, right? When I go against the promise that I made to God, God, I'll love you, God, I'll follow you, God, I'll chase after you, it's really easy to get in that moment and say, God, I'm good, right? God, I don't know if I can do this anymore. So here's what I wanna do this morning. This morning, I wanna highlight three missteps that Jonah took that allowed him to get to the place where he wanted to give up. And my hope is that we would learn from these so that we don't take these missteps. Why? So that we don't give up. I want us to have a faith that lasts. How many guys want that this morning? I want that. Here we go. What's misstep number one? Misstep number one is this idea that Jonah believed that he could run from God. Jonah actually believed that he could run from God. And if you have your Bibles, look at Jonah chapter one. Starting in verse one, it says this. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to free from, free, flee from the Lord. That's hard to say, flee from the Lord. Verse four, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below the deck where he laid down and fell into a deep sleep. Verse six, then the captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Here is what we need to know about Jonah. First and foremost, Jonah was a Jewish prophet. Jonah was, was around alive around the time of 760 BC. And so Jonah, he's, he's a prophet. He's someone who literally speaks the words of God to special groups of people. And Jonah gets this call from God to go and preach to the ancient city of Nineveh. Now here's what you need to know about Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian kingdom. And the Assyrians around 760 BC, uh, where Jonah was alive, the Assyrians were brutal. Right? These were people who were known for brutally killing their enemies. These were people who, who were known for their harshness. These were people who were known specifically for their oppression of the Jewish people. And what kind of prophet is Jonah? He's Jewish. And so the Assyrians have this, this tumultuous, this toxic relationship with the Jewish people. And God sends word to Jonah and says, Jonah, I want you to go preach. And Jonah's like, yeah, God, cool, I can do that. I'm a prophet, that's what I do. Where? And God says, Nineveh. And to us, we read this and we're like, oh, why didn't he wanna go to Nineveh? I mean, it speaks about it in chapter four and we'll get there a little bit later. But Jonah so hated the Ninevites. He so hated, so despised them because of their oppression to the Jewish people that he would rather see them condemned in eternity than see them saved. That's a deep hatred, right? And so God says, hey, go preach to Nineveh. And Jonah says, no, and he runs from God. Can I just tell you real quick that there's no place that you can go that God is not? Right, like there's no place that you can run away. There's no place that you can hide. We serve an omnipotent and omnipresent God, don't we? And so when Jonah runs, he's actually fooling himself. But there are some consequences to running from God, aren't there? Uh, I want you to see a few consequences. I want you to see what happens when Jonah runs. I want you to see what happens when we try to run. The, the first thing is, when you try to run from God, there's always a cost. When you try to run from God, there's always a cost. Jonah chapter one, starting in verse three, it says this. It says, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After, everyone say paying. After paying the fare, he went abroad and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Literally speaking here, Jonah running from God cost him money. 
He had to go to this port. He had to pay his own way to go to a completely different city. It cost Jonah. And for us, when we run from God, you guys, typically there's not a financial cost, but running from God will cost you something, won't it? It might cost you your friends when you run. It might cost you your reputation. Believe me, I know friends, I know pastors who've lost their families and their ministries because they chose to run from God. Guys, don't miss this. If you run far enough, it'll cost you your soul, right? There's always a cost when you run from God. The second thing that happens when we run from God is oftentimes we hurt other people. Jonah chapter one, starting in verse four, it says this, it says, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. Don't miss this. Who chose to run from God? I don't say Jonah, but who was affected by this storm? Everyone was. All the sailors were afraid. All the sailors cried out. All of the sailors, their mission changed from getting to Tarshish, getting this cargo ship that was gonna help make them money, bring them income. Their mission changed from getting to Tarshish to just surviving. And guys, when you run from God, the same thing happens. Man, your decisions are never lived in isolation. Every decision that we make affects somebody else. And so when you choose to run from God, other people are afraid for you, aren't they? Other people start doing what the sailors do and they start crying out to God, God, would you bring them back? Would you, would you restore their soul? Other people, they go from living on mission to seek and save the lost to having to seek and save a person who already knows Jesus. Running, it doesn't just affect you, it hurts other people, and then lastly, don't miss this. There's a third cost. It's this truth that when we run, we become apathetic. And the word apathy means means, means lazy. It means we, we just stop caring. And I want you to see what happens with Jonah. Like, this is, this is so crazy. In verse five, it says this. It says, all the sailors were afraid and they cried out to his own God and they, they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he laid down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. The storm's going on. There's wind, there's waves, there there are sailors throwing things off this boat. And where is Jonah? He's sleeping. Why? Because he doesn't care. Guys, when we run from God, we can end up in a state of apathy, can't we? We can end up in this state where we're so far from God, we're so far removed from the call that God has placed on us, we become spiritually sleeping. And so what's that lead us to? It leads us to this truth that running from God often turns into us having a run-in with God. Running from God often turns into us having a run-in with God. And Jonah's run-in was this storm. God was trying to get Jonah's attention from this storm. And does God send every storm into our life? No, absolutely not. But God can use every storm, amen? Amen. If you're going through a storm right now, whether it's financial, whether it's relational, whether it's with things at work, please don't waste this storm. Allow God to get your attention and wake up from your apathy. When you run, you become apathetic. And I just want you to think about Jonah for a second, how crazy it is that he would be in the middle of this storm and he's sleeping. My hope is that would never be said about my faith or yours, right? Misstep number one, Jonah thought he could run from God. Go ahead and write down the second one. The second misstep that Jonah took is this idea that he allowed his situation to determine his faith. Jonah allowed his situation to determine his faith. And if you have your Bibles, go and look at Jonah chapter two. 
Jonah chapter two, this is the part of the story where Jonah is now inside the fish, right? The, the sailors have thrown him over, he's inside the fish, and I want you to see how Jonah's perspective changes here. Starting in chapter two, verse eight, this is Jonah's prayer, Jonah's promise, Jonah's song to the Lord. Verse eight, this is what he says. He says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. What's going on here with Jonah? Well, he's inside the fish, and he and God, they have this kind of relationship restoration moment where Jonah comes back to God, and things are good. And Jonah's like, God, you're good. You're great. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to serve you. And Jonah goes, and he goes to the city of Nineveh, and he preaches one of the most simple messages ever. He basically says, hey, if you guys don't like stop being like sinful, like God's gonna kill you, right? And, and the craziest thing happens, the entire city of Nineveh repents. Legitimately, thousands of people are on their knees, they're crying out to God. And I want you to notice Jonah's response. Jonah chapter four, go ahead and look at that, starting in verse one. It says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. I wanna pause here for a moment because I want us to see the spiritual roller coaster that Jonah is riding. In Jonah chapter one, when Jonah has a choice, what does he do? He runs from God. And then he's inside the fish, he's got nowhere to go. God, you're great, I need you, save me. I'm gonna sacrifice to you, I'll, I'll vow. And then the fish um, ejects him, right? Okay, whatever. Um, he, he ends up on land, he goes to Nineveh, he preaches, and then when Jonah has a choice again, what's he saying to God? God, I'm so upset with you. God, I'm so upset that I wish I were dead. Why do you think Jonah's riding this spiritual roller coaster? Personally, I believe that Jonah's riding this spiritual roller coaster because he's allowing his situation to affect his faith. He's allowing what he sees, who he's around, what his, his circumstances are to determine his relationship with God. And, and here's the truth. We do this all the time, don't we? When things are good, God, I don't need to go to church today. Well, when things are good, oh, I, can, I can read my Bible next week. Well, when things are good, oh, okay, that's the Christian station. No, I'll just, I'll just watch Netflix, right? But when things are bad, Jesus, where are you at, right? I've been going to church like last month. I've been tithing a few times. I was in my life group last year. Where are you at, right? We allow our situations to determine our faith. Guys, I wanna encourage you to be someone who doesn't allow your situations to determine your faith, but rather you allow your faith to inform your situations. What if you understood this truth that whether times are good or times are bad, there is still a God who is always good? One of my favorite, yeah, you can clap for that, that's good. One of my favorite Bible passages is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, which says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'd encourage you guys to check it out later today. He goes on to tell us to focus on the unseen God, right? Because what we see around us oftentimes, it's not good, 
It's struggle, it's frustration, it's anxiety, it's worry. But what's Paul tell us to do? What does the story of Jonah illustrate for us? It illustrates this idea that we will ride a spiritual roller coaster if we focus on our circumstances. But Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 tells us, don't worry about what you see, but focus on the unseen God, the one who is the master and creator of this universe. And when you focus on him, your circumstances can be dark, but you can still have inner joy and love and peace. Why? Because your God is not a God of circumstances. Your God is a God of sacrifice and love and salvation. And when you focus on him, there's something amazing that happens on the inside of you where you can feel the fruit of the Spirit. You can feel the peace and the presence of God even when everything around you looks dark. What does Paul say? He says, focus on honoring Jesus through the storms and watch how your faith will last through tough times. Third misstep, go on and write this down. The third misstep that Jonah took is he allowed his comfort, right, to be put over his calling. Jonah put his comfort over his calling. And we're gonna be in Jonah chapter four, starting in verse five. Verse five, it says this. It said, Jonah had gone out and sat at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and he waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to live than to die. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I have not concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also so many animals. This is the craziest end to any Bible book that I have read, which I've read, um, I think all of them, okay? The book just kind of ends. And Jonah at the end of this book is picking an argument with God over a, everyone say plant, over a plant, right? Jonah is so upset. He says, I wish I could die over this plant. And let me tell you what's happening here. Jonah, he goes and he preaches and he says, hey, there, there's, there, there's something coming. You need to repent. And the city repents and they're on their knees and they're crying out to God. And Jonah goes up on this hill and he can kind of overlook the city of Nineveh. And he sits down and, and it's hot. And Jonah is just angry, right? He's like, God, why are they repenting? Why are you allowing this to happen? Don't you know what they've done to your people, right? He's upset about the Jewish oppression that they faced, and God allows this plant to spring up. So this plant springs up, it provides shade for Jonah, and scripture tells us Jonah was happy about the plant, right? It's like one of the first positive things that we see in Jonah is that he was actually happy about a plant. But then the next day, what happens to that plant? dies, right? God, God removes this plant, and in the midst of a city, Scripture tells us 120,000 people repenting. What does Jonah focus on? He doesn't focus on what he was called to do. He doesn't focus on, on being a pastor or a minister or a prophet to the city of Nineveh. No, no, no. He focuses on his comfort. He focuses on, well, God, I don't feel good right now. God, it's so hot, I feel like I could die. And what God is trying to show Jonah is, listen, Jonah, there's 120,000 people who are coming back to me and you're worried about a plant? It's about your comfort. And guys, this is probably one of the more interesting parts of this story because this is where I can almost... Um, I don't know, unashamedly, or I guess ashamedly identify with Jonah because time and time again, 
I've put my own comfort over my calling. Time and time again, there have been moments where I've been asked, hey, can you help? And I'm like, man, I really just wanna go get some sleep tonight, right? Hey, can you serve? Oh, I served last weekend, do I have to? Comfort over calling. You know, one of the things I love about this church is we are a church that really puts our calling above our comfort. You know, every single week I get to serve with some amazing adults who love and encourage students on a weekly basis, and I know they have jobs, I know they're tired, I know they have families, but every single week they lean into that calling and they say, hey, I know I could be comfortable, but Jesus did not die to keep me comfortable, amen? Jesus died so that I can make an impact and show sacrifice and love. And so I'm going to do that every single week. Can I just encourage you this week to not be a person who leans into comfort, but you lean into the call that God has placed on your life. Lean into your calling. It might feel uncomfortable, but I wanna encourage you to embrace it and know that you are sharing Jesus through your calling. Jonah made three major missteps. You know, he, he believed he could run from God. He allowed his situations to determine his faith. And lastly, he put his comfort over his calling. And maybe today you're someone right now who's struggling with one of those missteps or maybe even one that I didn't talk about. Please hear me. You can go from walking in missteps to walking in step with God. If you do these three things, real quick, go ahead and write these down. How do you go from walking in missteps to walking in step? Well, number one, you run to God. You run to God. Notice, when did Jonah get in trouble? He got in trouble every time he chose to run away from God. And so when you're experiencing life's issues, when you're experiencing life's problems, instead of running away from God, choose to run to God. I love what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 28, he said this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What's this mean, you guys? It means that we have a God who wants to walk with us through life's problems. So many times we get the idea that if we go to God, we're gonna experience judgment, we're gonna experience shame, we're gonna experience guilt, but please remember this fact, that we serve a God who is loving, who is encouraging, and who wants us to come back home, amen? Run to God. Second thing you can do from going from missteps to instep is you can stand firm in your faith. You can stand firm in your faith. Remember, Jonah, his faith was rooted in what he saw. His faith was, was based in his situations, right? But I wanna remind you that our faith is not based off of circumstances or good reports or good health things. Our circumstances don't mean anything when it comes to faith because our faith is not rooted in them, but our faith is rooted in an event that there was a man named Jesus who lived a perfect life, who died for our sins, and three days later rose, and there is an empty tomb. That is what our faith is rooted in. It doesn't matter what you see, but it matters who you trust, right? Don't allow your circumstances to, de to determine your faith. Rather, stand firm in the truth that three days later after Jesus resurrected, there was an empty tomb. And last thing, how do you walk in step? You just choose obedience. You just choose obedience every single day time. First Peter chapter one, verse 14, it says this. It says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. I love that first phrase, obedient children. You know, I have a daughter and she's five. And one of the things we talk about all the time is you need to listen the first time. How many of you guys as parents have talked about that? Man, I wonder how many times God is saying that to us, Right? Alex, would you just listen the first time? 
Alex, would you just trust that what I have to say is good for you? Here's where obedience and disobedience come into play. It's this idea that disobedience comes oftentimes because we think we know better. Guys, that's what happens in the story of Jonah. God tells Jonah, go and preach, go and run to tell the people that I love them and I care about them and I want a relationship with them and the sin it's gonna cost them. And Jonah thinks he knows better, so he chooses to run. Guys, your, your disobedience will cost you. And could I just encourage you today to stay in step with God by number one, running to him. By, by number two, standing firm. And then lastly, number three, choosing obedience every single time. We can go from missteps to in step with God if we do those three things. Before I close, I just, I just have to throw this out there. The reason why we can walk in step with God is because we had a God who literally walked in our steps. We had a God who, who came with skin and bone named Jesus who lived a perfect life and died for us. And if you wanna accept Christ, today can be your day. As everyone leaves, you can come forward. There's gonna be a decision counselor here. But for the rest of us, let's learn from this story of Jonah. Let's be people who throw away our missteps, but let's run to God. Let's stand firm in our faith and let's choose obedience every single time. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. And right now, Lord, I just pray as, as, if there is anyone who is walking in missteps, God, that today would be the day that they go from missteps to instep with you. God, I pray if there's, if there's anything going on on the inside of us, God, that, that you feel like we're calling us to, God, calling us to repent, God, calling us to confess, God, calling us to, to step up and, and lead in. Father, I pray that we would trust that voice and we would walk in obedience. Father, thank you for the example that we learned from the story of Jonah today. God, may we apply its truth and walk in step with you this week. We love you, Lord. In your son's name we pray, amen.